You guys can go ahead and have a seat here this morning. We want to welcome you again to Calvary. My name is Robert. I'm the, the junior high and high school pastor here. Just excited to spend the morning with you. While you're getting settled in, go ahead and open up to the book of John. Book of John chapter 15. If you don't have a Bible, go ahead and take one of the Bibles uh, out of the seat back in front of you. Uh, if you do have one of those Bibles, be page 1071 as we jump into John chapter 15 this morning. Um, we're right in the middle, uh, or actually at the beginning of a series called Character 101. We're looking at the fruit of the Spirit, these nine character traits that God has committed to developing in our life. And, and we're going to be going through each of these nine character traits. Last week, Pastor O.C. started this off looking at the, the topic of love and, and how love is a character trait that the Holy Spirit is committed to developing us, and he unpacked how we can live lives of love and to show the love of Jesus to others. And, and so we're going to be going through the fruit of the Spirit, these nine things, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, these nine things that the Holy Spirit wants all of us to have as part of our character. And this is important because we want to have God's character. We want to, to live lives that reflect him because the truth is we can't represent Jesus to the world around us unless we reflect his character. Uh, and so it comes back to us saying, we want this, we desire this, this needs to happen. And so today we're going to be talking about the, the, uh, the issue of joy, the, the topic of joy. And, and as we get into this, just a simple question, not going to have to think hard on this one, but how many of you would say that you desire to have more joy in your life? Okay, this is an easy question. This is kind of like me coming up here and being like, hey, who wants some free money? Line up over there. Or, you know, you asking your kids, hey, do you want more ice cream for dessert? This is an easy question. We all desire this. We all want more joy. And yet, we all have that, like, longing and striving that, that happens with the topic of joy. I think this is interesting because of where we live, too. We live in a vacation, destination, recreation hotspot. Havasu is known for, for people coming here, whether to move here or just to vacation here and recreate here to enjoy the town or the desert or the lake or the channel, if that's what they're into. People come here to have fun, and yet just like anywhere else, people here have a longing for more joy. And beyond that, we live in the United States of America, as you know, if you don't, there you go, your tidbit for the morning, you live in the United States. You're welcome. Um, but, but our country is founded on this document, the Declaration of Independence, and in that it says that we have the right to three things, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We're told this growing up, we're educated this in school, but that last line has always kind of gripped me a little bit. The pursuit of happiness doesn't say that we have the right to the pursuit of life or the pursuit of liberty, just the pursuit of happiness. And even in the wording, it's kind of like something that's, that's running away from us, that we're chasing, that we're longing after, that we're going after. So why is that? Why is it something that we have to chase? And as we unpack this idea of joy, I think it starts with us understanding that as much as we might like to lump joy and happiness together as one idea, as one thing, the truth is they're two very different things. And it starts with us saying, okay, before we get into joy, let's understand the difference between joy and happiness. Because happiness is something that is based on where we're at right now. The situation we're in, how we're feeling about it, it has to do with our emotions, our feelings, the, 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 the outlook of our present situation. In other words, happiness is temporary. It, it ebbs and flows based on the day, based on the hour, based on the minute. But joy is something different. Joy is something that's lasting. Joy has to do with what our outlook on life is. Joy is something that comes from God working in our life and us saying, you know what, despite whether or not I'm happy, I'm going to have joy in life. And the interesting thing about this is you can have joy without having happiness in the moment. The other side of it is you can have happiness without having true joy. And so we're going to unpack where we get joy, how we can have that in our life, how we can kind of work to develop this on a, a regular basis in our life. And, and as we do that, we're going to be looking at the book of John, chapter 15. And we're going to be looking at uh, verses 9 through 11, but I'm actually going to read verses 4 and 5 as well to lead us into that. So let's take a look at that. John chapter 15, starting in verse 4, it says this. It says, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. 
I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. From apart from me, you can do nothing. Verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Hear this. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. That last line is amazing. Jesus has spoken these words, declared these things to us so that we would have his joy and that our joy may be full. It gets back to that question, who wants more joy? Who wants a life that is full of joy? Not full of it, but full of joy. And notice as well that as, as we started this, Jesus is saying that, that we only bear fruit when we abide in him. It gets back to the fruit of the Spirit. If we want these things in our life, it needs to be rooted in Jesus. If we pursue after them on their own, they don't come. We can't just simply pursue joy and expect to get joy. We can't just pursue peace and patience and kindness and expect to, to get that. We only bear fruit when we abide in Jesus. So let's unpack this a little bit, where we can find joy in our life. And it starts first with understanding God's love for you. This is the root of the whole thing. And you might be thinking, okay, pastor, you do realize that last week was love, right? We already kind of covered this. But, but hear me out on this, because we need to understand God's love for us and how he cares about us and cares for us in order for us to have joy. Because if joy is something that we want to have through all situations, not just the good situations, but in every moment of life, it has to be rooted in that. So at the root of this quest for joy is a need for us to understand our Savior, to understand our Creator and how he thinks about us. So 1 John 3 says this. It says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. God's love is demonstrated in the fact that he chooses to call us his, ch his children. He's not forced to call us his family. He's not forced to love us. He chooses to love us. He chooses to adopt us into his family Despite our situations, despite our regrets, despite our past or our current situation, or our future issues, God the Father chooses to love us and adopt us. This is good news. This is good news that, that Jesus came to live a perfect and sinless life and to die on a cross to take the punishment we deserve, all so that we could be called God's children. And if you've been around church in a while, you've heard this, but the good thing is that good news is good news whether it's the first time you hear it or the hundredth time you hear it. And so this is good news because it shows God's commitment to care about us, God's commitment to love us. And so whether or not we have people in our life that are, are caring about us and sacrificing for us and showing love to us, we have a creator who has done that. Whether or not our situation is good and, and we are at peace with the things that are happening around us, God still chooses to love us. And so often we struggle with joy because we face our life and we focus on the, the situations in front of us. We, we focus on what's happening right now or what we fear to happen in the future and we just get wrapped up in that. Instead, God's saying, hey, I love you, and I'm going to help you and, and work in your life through anything. You can face tomorrow if you choose to focus on me. And we have a choice in that as well. We have the choice on what we focus on. So today, if you want to start down this, this road to joy, it starts with understanding God's love in your life, that he loves you, that he cares about you, that he chooses to love you. And see, the book of Romans says that we can find joy because of this. Romans chapter 5 says that, that we can rejoice in our sufferings. If, any, if anywhere there seems to be a little bit of a, a, a contradiction, it's there. Rejoicing in sufferings doesn't seem appropriate or possible, but the apostle Paul says this in Romans chapter 5. says, we can rejoice in our sufferings. 
because God's love has worked through our life, and he says that when we suffer, suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, which is rooted in Christ. So find joy in the unchanging, unconditional love of God, but on the flip side of that, find joy in following him and loving him in return. See, Jesus here in John 15 says, if you abide in me, that's where you will find joy and your joy will be full. He's saying that this exchange with God's love and our joy is an exchange. It's a two-way street. It's, it's not a highway and a bike path for us. It, it requires us following him and, and obeying his commandments, as Jesus says here. And so know that, that if you want the joy of Jesus in your life and involves us following him and abiding or dwelling with Jesus. The book of Psalms puts it this way. Psalm 1611 says this. It says, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Psalmist shows us that we find joy when we follow Jesus and his plan for our life. So let me ask you this morning, how is your relationship with Jesus? Particularly if you're sitting here and you're like, man, I'd really like some joy in my life. How is your relationship with Jesus? Jesus says that if you abide in me, and it's that idea of dwelling, being close to, spending time with him. Because that's the root of this. As much as we may like to think this, joy doesn't come from our success, our achievements, our possessions, our, our activities and recreation, joy comes from growing in a relationship with Jesus. So that's the start of it. First step on this journey to joy is to understand Jesus' love. And the second thing is to serve others. To serve others. See, I think when, when we recognize in our life that, that we kind of need more joy, and we're in the, uh, the point of our life where you're like, it's just kind of dry, I don't have much joy, or, or maybe we even use it, you know, I'm not really happy right now, we use that language. I think most of us, I know I do, I kind of focus on me, okay, what do I need to do, what do I need to change? But we do that, I start to look at myself, okay, uh, do I need to, you know, spend more time here? Do I need to change hobbies or, or spend more time in my hobbies? Do we need to go on vacation? Some people might say, oh, I need to change jobs, or we, you know, I need to move because my problems won't follow me if I go to a new city, or, or whatever it might be. But all that's focused on us. Sometimes when we pursue joy, we pursue it with us as the subject. Our goals, our interests, our motivations, our achievements. And those are the outward actions that we use to pursue joy. Book of Philippians gives us a different set of outward actions to pursue joy with. Paul says this in Philippians chapter 2. He says this, Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, and being in full accord of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others as more significant than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. He would go on to say that we should do this because it's the, the example that Jesus set for us. He uses language that Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he humbled himself and took on the form of a servant. Jesus was clear in his teaching that if we want greatness in life, it comes through serving. In the same way, if we want joy in life, it comes through serving other people. Here's two reasons why I think that. First, when we serve, we get to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. We get to be a part of something big. At each of the services, we've shared the, the amount of money that you all raised to support the hurricane victims. And, and at the services, there was cheers, there was celebrations. At the 8 o'clock, you could even backstage hear some gasps and some wows. And it's exciting because we get to be a part of that, something bigger than ourselves. And I've never been in a, an opportunity where people served or did something and they said, yeah, we made a difference. No one's ever gone, man, we really helped them. I shouldn't have come. No one's gone, wow, it's amazing the difference we made in their life and what we're able to do and accomplish. I really regret showing up today. 
No one ever says that because we, deep down we all want to be a part of something bigger than us. We all want to, to serve and make a difference in our world. And so I think that's the first reason we find joy in serving, but the second and most important reason is we find joy in serving because when we serve, we're following God's plan for our life. Jesus modeled it for us. The plan and the path for our life is to serve others. And whenever we're in God's will for our life, whenever we're following his design for our life, we find joy in that. So let me ask you this morning, how can you serve? Where can you get plugged in serving? We've got a lot of opportunities here. We're always presenting them. We've got a lot because we want to be a church that serves, serves our, our, our community, serves our, our state, our nation. And so we want to serve. And we've got a big opportunity coming up in just four weeks. And you've heard us talk about it. And we're going to keep talking about it until it happens and then a little bit after even. Uh, but on October 7th, we're doing something we call Serve Our Schools. And this is something that... that uh, members of our team have been working on for six or eight months at least. And what's going to happen is on October 7th, that morning, we're going to have 10 work projects at all 10 of the school campuses around our city. And we've gone and met with the principals and said, hey, if we could do anything, what would you want us to do? And some of the schools, it's, it's really ambitious projects that will really make a difference for some. They're just like, hey, if, if we could just get some new blinds up in this, this classroom, that would be amazing. And we're like, done, we'll do it. But we still need help with this. Our, our vision is to have 1,000 people mobilized at all 100 of those projects to make a difference in our schools. But we still need help. We need people to sign up to say, you know what, I'm going to take on that project. I'm going to adopt that. I'm going to commit to helping in that area. We still need businesses to partner with us for supplies and materials on some of those, um, some of those projects. So, so how can you get plugged in? How can you get your, your friends, your family, your life group together to partner in that project with us? On the flip side of that, how can you get plugged in serving here at the church? We talk a lot about serving in our community, and, and that's what we want. We want to be a church that's focused on our community, but, but we also have a need to serve here within the walls of the church. Because our mission statement as a church is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus through the love of his people and the power of his truth. That mission statement requires people for it to be carried out. And not just people as in the church staff, but us us as a church family willing to serve in areas of ministry, willing to show the love of Jesus to people as they come in the walls of this church. So how can you serve? What areas of ministry here at the church are you interested in and passionate about that you can get plugged in? You might be thinking, I don't really have anything. Like, I don't, I don't have anything that would be useful. But that's not true. The book of 1 Peter says that all of us have received gifts from God, and we should use them to serve others as good stewards of God's great gifts. So the truth is, God has given each of you passions and interests and abilities and talents. And many of you are, uh, many of you are using those in vocational and, and recreational uh, capacities. But the truth is that God wants you to use them in areas of service, too. So how can you serve? How can you get plugged into ministries? Maybe you, there's an area that you're interested in and passionate about that we're not doing anything. Come talk to us. Help us make something happen and get something started so that we can lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. So if you want to find joy in your life, it starts with understanding Christ's love for you, serving others, and finally placing our hope in eternity. See, I think the issue of, of hope and joy are tied together. Because if our joy goes away, it's often because there's hope that, that went away as well. If our hope is based in something that's solid, joy is something that's a little easier for us to have in life. But if our hope is wavering, if our hope goes away, then that joy often goes with it. And so something I want you guys to ponder is where is your hope placed? And, and I, would, I would desire for you to say that your hope is placed in Christ, that your hope is placed in God's word, that your hope is placed in eternity. But I think for some of us, it's really easy for our hope to shift from the place we want it to be to the place it actually is. 
For some of us, uh, our hope may have shifted into our careers, our jobs, our vocations. And we might say, hey, this is where my hope is. I, I find excitement when things are going well, but it goes away when the job changes or goes away. For some of you, your hope is in your kids and their future and their success and their path for life. But what happens when that changes? We see it all the time as well in our nation that, that people place their hope in our country and its success and its appearance in the global marketplace. And every four years, people on one side of the, the party get upset because their presidential candidate didn't get elected. And so their hope goes away, despair sets in. And see, all this illustrates that if our hope is put in something temporary, our joy will be temporary. If our hope is put in something that at one point didn't exist, there's a good chance at one point in the future it won't exist. Scripture tells us that if we want to have hope, it needs to be built in something that lasts. Hebrews 12, 2 says that we should look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. It says that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Now, we're church people. We're sitting here at church 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning. We've made church a priority, and for many of us, the cross is something we're just like, cool, cross, yep, got it, Next. We've got crosses in our yards, we've got crosses on our back windows of our cars, we've got crosses in our living room, we've got crosses on our keychain, some of you got crosses on your skin and tattoos, we got crosses. And so it's easy for us to see the cross as a celebration point because of what Jesus has done for us, but let's think about that passage. For Jesus, as he was looking ahead to the cross, it says, had joy in enduring it. What did he endure? First, when Christ endured the cross, he endured the punishment of the sins of the entire world, the punishment that we deserved. And he endured the cross, he endured pain and suffering beyond what we could imagine in an excruciating form of death and execution. When he endured the cross, he endured betrayal and abandonment of the people that were closest to him, people that he had spent years investing his life into. When he endured the cross, he endured the humiliation, the mockery, the embarrassment of that form of death. It says he endured the cross. Why? For the joy set before him. When we look at the cross, it's difficult to say that's a thing of joy. We look at the pain, the suffering, the abandonment, the betrayal, the humiliation, there isn't joy in that list. And yet it says that Jesus endured the cross for the joy set before him. His joy wasn't in the, the cross itself, but his joy was in the eternal significance of what was happening. His joy was based in the fact that his actions meant we could be forgiven. His joy was in the fact that his actions were part of God's plan for humanity, his eternal plan for people. His joy was built in that. So when it says the joy set before him, his joy wasn't in the crown of thorns. His joy wasn't in the wooden cross or the nails that would pierce his flesh. His joy was in the hope of being set at the right hand of God, surrounded by redeemed and forgiven people, us, Jesus endured the cross for the joy set before him and the eternal significance of that. And this matters because if we want to have joy through the difficulties of life, our focus needs to be set on heaven. We need to make the choice to not focus on the, the situations we're in, but on the hope that we have in eternity. And understanding that, that if we are a follower of Christ, this is as bad as things get for us because we have the promise of a place with no pain, no suffering, no regrets, no brokenness, no shame. Because if the joy of heaven is set before us, we can endure anything here on earth. So today, how is your joy? How is your joy? Is your joy full? 
That's our, that's our hope for you. We would, we would desire that for us, but, but we also have to understand we can't force or manufacture or create joy in our life. We also can't fake it. Joy is something that only comes through knowing Jesus and following his plan for our life. And it's our prayer today that you would understand God's love for you and you would love him in return. And that as you do that, you would follow his plan of serving people and focusing on eternity through the good times and the difficult times. And as you do this, that you would find joy. So today, let us fix our eyes on Christ, the founder and perfecter of our faith, so that we may have joy and that our joy may be full. Let's pray.